Hi everyone and welcome back to another step one review for neurology. This is High Yield Clinical Presentations Part 1. The first patient has a failure of caudal neuropore closure. There is a tuft of hair on their back and it is a high AFP. This is spina bifida occulta. The next one also has a failure of caudal neuropore closure. However, they have meninges and spinal cord that's exposed. This is myalomeningocele. Next one is a failure of rostral neuropore closure, and they have polyhydramnios. This is anencephaly. The reason they have polyhydramnios is because they don't have a well-developed swallowing center. Next is a patient that presents with a single ventricle, failure of prosencephalon to separate. This is holoprosencephaly. It's seen alongside other midline defects in Patel syndrome. Next is a patient with cerebellar tonsils below the foramen mag magnum, and this is associated with syringal myalia. This is chiuria 1 malformation. Next is a patient who has a cerebellar vermis and tonsils that are below the foramen magnum. They also have an associated myalomeningocele. This is chiria type 2 malformation. Next is a baby with dilated fourth ventricle, hydrocephalus, and a small vermis. This is Dandy Walker syndrome. Remember D for dilated fourth ventricle, W for water in the brain or hydrocephalus, and S for small vermis. Next is a patient that presents with a cape-like loss of pain and temperature in the upper extremities bilaterally. This is syringomyalia. This is a syrinx or a ball of fluid that forms and compresses the spinothalamic tract bilaterally in the cervical spinal cord. Next is a patient with a wide base gait, nystagmus, the vermis, vestigial, or the flocculonodular lobes are affected. This is truncal ataxia. Next is a patient with dysdiatokinesia, and the lateral cerebellum is affected. This is appendicular ataxia. Next is a patient that presents with a high blood pressure, a bradycardia, and a bradypnea. This is called Cushing's reflex. It's a result of increased intracranial pressure. Next is a patient who has flexion of the upper extremities, extension of the lower extremities, and the lesion is above the red nucleus. This is decorticate posturing. In this case, only, only the lower extremities are extended. The next patient has both upper and lower extremities extended. There's a lesion below the red nucleus. This is decerebrate posturing. Now you can remember this by having four E's in decerebrate, and so all four limbs are extended. Next is a patient with transient weakness on one side of the body. It lasts for less than 15 minutes or so. This is a transient ischemic attack. This is usually very acute and there are no lasting symptoms. Next is a baby who is born prematurely. They have a bulging fontanelle and there is blood in the intraventricular space that's typically seen on an ultrasound. This is neonatal intraventricular hemorrhage. Next is a patient with a fall who ends up in a lucid interval. That means that they typically, they do worse initially and then they get better and then all of a sudden they get worse. They have a lens shaped lesion on the MRI and the middle meningeal artery is affected. This is a epidural hematoma. This typically happens when there's a fall on the thinnest part of the skull, that's called a terion. Next is an elderly patient with a fall
and crescent-shaped hemorrhages that appear on imaging. Here, the bridging veins are affected. This is a subdural hematoma. Next is a patient with the worst headache ever, papilledema, a berry aneurysm, and the lumbar puncture is showing red blood cells. This is a subarachnoid hemorrhage. Now keep in mind that berry aneurysms form in patients who have polycystic kidney disease. So this is one of the common causes of death in that condition. Next is a patient who has a past medical history of hypertension, amyloidosis, or AV malformations. A patient with hypertension can have Charcot-Bouchard aneurysms. They present with hyperdense collections in the cerebral cortex. This is an intraparenchymal or intracranial hemorrhage. Next is a patient who has unilateral lower extremity weakness and sensory loss of the lower extremity. This is an ACA stroke. This is a medial artery and therefore it's going to affect the lower extremities. Next is a patient who has unilateral weakness and sensory loss in the upper extremities in the face. This is a MCA or middle cerebral artery stroke. Next is a patient who has a purely motor stroke. They have a past medical history of hypertension. This is a lenticulostriate artery stroke. Here, only the cortical spinal tract is affected. Next is a patient who has bitemporal hemianopsia and central vision is spared. This is a PCA stroke, posterior cerebral artery. Next is a patient with a contralateral loss of motor, ipsilateral down and out eye, and a branch of the PCA or the basilar is typically the one that's affected. This is medial midbrain syndrome, also called Weber syndrome. So the cortical spinal tract is affected, that's where you get the motor loss, and then you also have cranial nerve 3 oculomotor affected leading to a down and out eye. Next is a patient who has contralateral motor loss, contralateral loss of touch, vibration, proprioception, and inability to abduct the eye, and the basilar artery is affected. This is a medial pontine syndrome. Now, the motor loss and the touch vibration proprioception is because the cortical spinal tract and the medial lemniscus tract are affected, and also the abduction is due to the abducens nerve that's affected. Next is a patient who has contralateral loss of pain and temperature. There's an ipsilateral loss of pain and temperature on the face. There's facial drooping. There may be dizziness and hearing loss. There is ptosis, meiosis, and anhydrosis. And this is typically an ICA lesion. This is lateral pontine syndrome. So here, the loss of pain and temperature is because of the spinal thalamic tract, which is more lateral in the brainstem. It also has um, the cranial nerves 5 and 7 that you can see here that's affected, as well as the cervical sympathetic chain being affected, leading to Horner syndrome, which presents as ptosis, meiosis, and anhydrosis. Next is a patient who has contralateral motor loss, contralateral loss of touch, vibration, proprioception, ipsilateral tongue deviation, and the anterior spinal artery is affected. This is medial medullary syndrome. In this case, the cortical spinal tract, the medial lemniscus tract, and the hypoglossal nerve is affected. Next is a patient with a contralateral loss of pain and temperature, ipsilateral loss of pain and temperature on the face, difficulty swallowing, hoarseness of the voice, a lack of the gag reflex, and Horner syndrome. This is a pica lesion. This is lateral medullary syndrome. Again, you can see here as the spinal thalamic tract is affected, it's a lateral tract. You can see that cranial nerves 9, 10 um, are also affected, as well as you have Horner syndrome because of the cervical sympathetic chain um, that is affected here. Next is a patient with a history of a stroke that now presents with burning pain. Here, the thalamus is affected. This is post-stroke pain syndrome. Next is a patient who has acceleration and deacceleration injury. There are punctured hemorrhages and white matter. This is diffuse axonal injury. Typically, they might mention that they have shearing of white matter tracts.
Next is a patient who is able to follow commands. They have an inability to speak. There is a frontal lobe lesion. This is Broca's aphasia. Next patient is an inability to follow commands. Ability to speak is intact and the temporal lobe is affected. This is Wernicke's aphasia. Next is a patient who has difficulty repeating words or phrases. This is conduction aphasia. This is going to affect the tract that connects Broca and Wernicke. Next is a child who's playing soccer. He starts to sweat profusely. There is warm weather and the temperature is less than 104 Fahrenheit. This is heat exhaustion. This is more common in children with higher BMIs. Next one is a patient who is sweating profusely. He's unconscious and the temperature is greater than 104 Fahrenheit. This is a heat stroke. Next is a patient who is awake. He's tapping his fingers and this is localized to one area of the brain. This is a simple partial seizure. Next is a patient who is impaired. They have lip smacking and they're picking on their shirt. This is a complex partial seizure. Remember when it says partial seizure it affects one part of the brain and therefore they're going to have distinct clinical signs. Next, there's a patient who has impaired consciousness. They're jerking and then they're stiffening. This is generalized tonic-clonic seizure. Next is a patient with impaired consciousness and stiffening. This is a tonic seizure. So both for generalized tonic-clonic and for tonic, you can see that they are impaired and so they're unaware of what's going on. Next is a patient with impaired consciousness and quick repetitive movements. This is a generalized myoclonic or quick jerky movements. Next is a patient who has impaired consciousness and they drop to the floor. This is a atonic seizure. Next is a child who's staring blankly in space. On the EEG, they might have 3 hertz spike and wave discharges. This is an absence seizure. Bonus points if you know that the drug that treats absence seizure is ethosuximide. Next is a patient with a unilateral headache, eye pain, and tearing. This is a cluster headache. Treatment is oxygen. Next is a patient with a unilateral headache, flashing lights, a tingling sensation. It's worse with light and sound. This is a migraine headache. Next is a band-like headache with associated tightness in the shoulder muscles. This is a tension headache. Next is burning facial pain across the cheeks. It's worse with chewing or touching the cheek. This is trigeminal neuralgia. Next is an elderly patient with unilateral headaches and jaw pain and associated vision loss. This is giant cell arteritis. Next is a female with a high BMI, vitamin A use, headaches that are worse with movement, and papilledema on eye exam. This is idiopathic intracranial hypertension. Thank you for listening and see you in the next one.